to The Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner, and it's great to have you all with us. We're going to grapple with how we build a movement, how we deal with the oppression faced by many, how we address the growing tide of neo-fascism here and across the globe, and how we bring this diverse grouping of the left of progressives together to confront the future. We're going to do it by looking at history, because sometimes you have to dive into history, wrestle with what it says about the present. My guest today is Dr. Christina Heatherton. Her book is Arise. Now, we're going to start by looking at what she did at the beginning of the book about ropes. Yes, ropes. 13 simple twists that make a noose out of a rope, a noose to lynch and to kill. She makes the connections between the fiber grown, workers exploited to make the rope in the West, indigenous workers who fought back in Mexico and the Philippines, rope made that lynched black people here in America, rope made by international harvester that turned indigenous land into capitalist farms that led to the Haymarket Rebellion and the birth of May Day, that became the international workers' cry for justice, that to this day is called the Day of Martyrs of Chicago in Mexico, all connecting the oppression of Jim Crow, indigenous peasants, Filipino workers, and as she wrote, the interlocking universe of exploitation, expropriation, and oppression, ropes that bind those in oppression, that tie us together and hold together the capitalist world. And it's bound in ways we don't often think about. And in her book, she brings the voice of W.E.B. Du Bois, Frederick Douglass, along with communist organizers, feminist radicals, and others. And we see it all through the eyes of the Mexican Revolution and find out how profound its effect was on the entire planet. So her book, Arise, Radicalism in the Era of the Mexican Revolution. And it speaks volumes to our world today. Dr. Christina Heatherson is the Elting Professor of American Studies and Human Rights at Trinity College in Connecticut and co-editor of Policing the Planet while the policing crisis led to Black Lives Matter. And she joins us today to take us on a journey to the interlocking nature of the fighting for freedom and justice and against capitalist power. That's the soul of this book. It's so glad to be here. Thank you so much for that incredible introduction. Who needs a publicist? <laughs> <laughs> I'm always ready for a new job. So, so no <laughs> You know, I think we should open with uh, what I think is part of the centrality of your book. We don't really understand the decisive role that both Haiti and Mexico in particular in this book played in changing this planet, played in the world of revolution, played in social change. And I'd like you to kind of wrestle with that for a moment, just opening that up for all of our viewers and listeners, and also talk a bit about how you even got into all of this. Well, I, I appreciate that you introduced the book and yourself as somebody who comes from movements. You know, I think that this is where this book comes from and this is who it's uh, hoping to speak to. Uh, you know, I come to this book after having been a part of a number of different social movements uh, for a while and specifically helping to produce uh, pieces of popular and political education for 20 years, you know, working on a whole range of issues, racism, housing, militarism, policing. Um, and I think in the process of doing that work, I, I realized that, you know, the task is right now, we have to develop an imaginary of what we want and how to struggle for it that is as big as the forces that are arrayed against us. So that's the kind of task at hand. Um, in the process of doing that work, I realized a few things. I wanted to write about internationalism. I wanted to write about capitalism and racism and how they co-evolve together. Um, and I also wanted to write something, uh, you know, understanding that uh, people might not necessarily have a lot of that movement history behind them. So, you know, I wanted to write something that would be an introduction, something that would allow people who had never heard of Haymarket, you know, or people who maybe had only heard about, uh, you know, a certain kind of um, oppression to be able to understand how those histories interlocked and interconnected. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, in a, in a rough way, how I came to the project. Um, but you asked a few other questions in there that I want to make sure I address. <laughs> I mean, what, what, one of the things I think for most of us, we would never think about, we never think about Mexico as being central to this. You know, I mean, given, given the depth of racism in this country and the depth of racism against Mexicans, and the attitude people have, we have as a society, not understanding that while there's a revolution happening in Russia, there's a revolution in Mexico that brought together people from all over the globe. 
much like the Cuban Revolution did in the, in the in 1959, the early 60s here uh, in, in in this era. But in that era, in the beginning, where it started from, how Mexico was central to all that. I mean, talk a bit about that. I mean, that is that is something we don't think about. Right. Well, it's criminal how little we think about Mexico in, uh, you know, understanding U.S. history and politics and the formation of U.S. hegemony. I mean, part of the argument of the book is that U.S. hegemony, the ascendancy of it, comes decisively about in relationship to Mexico, you know, in addition to some things that we might be aware of, the conquest of land, you know, uh, starting from the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, you know, where the U.S. seizes almost half of Mexican territory to, as you said, just the question of Mexican labor. There are very, you know, vibrant, visible ways that we, you know, need to always grapple with the U.S.'s relationship to Mexico. But there are also some, you know, less obvious ways. In the book, I talk about how the U.S. became a creditor nation for the first time in relationship to Mexico. And a lot of the ways that it, uh, you know, the, the capacities with which it would come to superintend the global capitalist economy, it developed in relationship to Mexico. And so Mexico becomes this really central place, uh, you know, that w we need to think about uh, the U.S.'s relationship to, as radicals in the early 20th century did, in order to understand both the development of U.S. hegemony and, as I argue in the book, internationalism. One of the things that struck me immediately as I read this book besides all things I'd like to get into that I never knew before, and I love learning new stuff, <laughs> is, is that when we think of Mexico and its relation to this country and its relation to the rest of the world, we never think of it in terms of its importance, its grounding, how it, the, 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 the root of revolutions and the movements in the world, the root of the conflicts on the planet, in some ways are planted in Mexican soil and Mexican, in, in Mexican world. And I think that's something you, you raise throughout the book, but to me as part of the underpinning of the book, one, one of the underpinnings of the book, that we don't think about. So I want to, A, I want to talk about how you came to that, and, and, and B, just describe that a bit for people listening and watching um, what, that, what that means. Absolutely. Uh, well, I think it's it's absolutely criminal that we don't think about Mexico, uh, you know, in every instance of how we think about U.S. history and the growth of U.S. power and arguments about radical movements, you know, especially over the 20th century. Uh, you know, Mexico, if we just think territorially, uh, we think about how, you know, with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, in 1848, the U.S. seizes, you know, almost uh, half of Mexico's territory. So we couldn't imagine the shape of the United States without Mexico. Um, obviously, people think quite a lot about just the role of Mexican labor, how critical Mexican people have been to the construction of this country. But the book also talks about, uh, you know, some lesser known aspects of the U.S.'s relationship to Mexico, namely that it was in Mexico that the U.S. became a creditor nation for the first time in its history. Uh, and so I argue in the book that many of the ways that the U.S. learned how to superintend the global capitalist economy came about in its relationship to Mexico. So, you know, I, in, on, on one hand, it, Mexico is, you know, not centrally a part of the narrative of uh, U.S. state formation. On the other hand, when you go into the archives of radicals, when you look at speeches and writings of people like Frederick Douglass or W.E.B. Du Bois, let alone Mexican radicals like Ricardo Flores Magón, you see that they are continually drawing attention to this relationship and saying that not only do radicals in the United States, but radicals around the world need to be conscious of this relationship because it has implications for the whole planet. And this is, so let's take it from back there. I mean, one, of the, one of the characters in the early part of this book uh, is a man named Charles Stillman. And the world that he created, and, you know, I don't, but some people have uh, their bank accounts at Citibank. <laughs> and, but, and the roots of their nefarious profits lie here, lie in the 1840s, lie with this man Stillman and what he did to undermine Mexico and to control their economy and world and exploit them. And that is Citibank, right? Mm -hmm. So at, let's tell that story. Sure. Well, you know, in Mexico, Charles Stillman 
was known as Don Carlos. Uh, you know, here in Connecticut, where he was from, he was called Charles. Uh, <laughs> and his interest in Mexico represented, uh, you know, the first major incursion of a U.S. speculator into Mexican territory. And, you know, historians like John Totino and, and John Mason Hart have, have explored this. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, Stillman's got this really interesting story where I, I, I start one of the chapters with the story of Baghdad, Mexico, which was essentially Stillman's own private port. He, uh, you know, basically he was, he, he owned everything. He, uh, you know, owned the banks, he owned the uh, warehouse and storage facility. He owned transportation companies. And the main commodity that was traded there was cotton. Uh, so during the U.S. Civil War, there was a union blockade of the Confederacy, you know, trying to strangle the Confederate economy, most of, most of which consisted of cotton. And so Baghdad, Mexico served as this illicit backdoor through which uh, Confederate cotton produced by enslaved labor could be smuggled. Uh, it was um, put into the name of one of uh, Stillman's Mexican trading partners, and a flag, a Mexican flag, was flown over it, and it was relabeled as Los Algodones, or you know, Mexican cotton, and dispatched for sale on the world's uh, market. So, you know, I talk about the the machinations of uh, you know putting out this illicit cotton into the world, and how much of a fortune this made Stillman. Um, uh, but I also talk about what happened, you know, so Stillman becomes one of the richest men in the world as a result of doing this. What's really interesting, though, is after the Civil War, uh, Stillman, along with all these other U.S. capitalists, have these massive amounts of money that they've made from the war that they're looking to move. And a lot of it gets invested into Mexican bonds and Mexican infrastructure. Uh, and so the story I tell is kind of twofold. I both tell the story about how U.S. land interest turned into a different kind of U.S. financial interest in Mexico that you can track through the relationship of Charles Stillman. But as you said, you know, the kind of punchline of the story is Charles Stillman's son is James Stillman, who becomes the head of what we now know as Citibank. And I think a lot of the punitive debt practices that these U.S. financiers develop in Mexico kind of prefigure the forms of punitive debt practices that get dispatched uh, by the U.S. and its entities around the world thereafter. And that kind of, in some ways, at, at, the, at the beginning of, of what you wrote, is tied together with how that in some ways is part of the root of the struggle of the Mexican Revolution, revolutions and revolution, and and how the Mexico became, along with Haiti in a certain period, this kind of place where revolutionaries gathered. And and there, even though it's not maybe not be a direct root to Stillman, it's it's rooted in that capitalist exploitation, which what it did because of what it did to Mexico and what it did to Haiti, as you write about that in the book as well, and how that kind of inspired people across the globe. I mean, it, it's a, it's and it, that's a really important piece. Because go, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, you know, there's a there's a 20th century version of that story that I tell a little bit about. You know, at the same time that the U.S. is starting to occupy Haiti. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of commentators in Mexico who are making very similar comments. You know, people are saying, like, how do you think about these different forms of U.S. incursion? How do you think about the presence or the threat of U.S. military in intervention? How do you think about, you know, the dominance of uh, U.S. Uh, financial interests and U.S. managers? But at the turn of the century, Ricardo Flores Magón makes this really stunning comment where he's like, you know, there's not just the kind of the overt military presence and the kind of cultural dominance here, he says, you have to look in the banks, in the, you know, the influence of judges, the, the way business is done in Mexico. And he says, soon it won't be long until nothing is done in this country without the permission of El Tio Samuel, of Uncle Sam, right? And so there's a, a, a you know, a, a self-conscious 20th century story about how the fate of Haiti and the fate of Mexico are understood together. But as you said, the book, you know, goes back and thinks about the Haitian Revolution and its relationship to the independent struggle of Mexico from Spain. And so to make a very long argument, uh, you know, hopefully not that long. Uh, <laughs> you know, right. I, make the argument. Make the argument. <laughs> I, tr I, I, I'm, I'm really thinking with people, uh, namely Frederick Douglass, to think about 
how the revolutions of the 19th century moved, uh, you know, emerged out of, uh, you know, what Manisha Sena calls an abolitionist international, you know, a way in which the Haitian revolution really inspired revolutionary struggles from around the world. So, you know, a kind of maybe not obvious um, way to think about this is, well, I mean, like I said, it's a long story, so I'm trying to find the easiest way in. But I mean, one interesting fact is that, you know, as Julia Scott writes about in A Common Wind, there there were stories of the Haitian Revolution that traversed throughout the Atlantic world, right, in, in the form of newspapers and oral, uh, you know, a testimony and, you know, a sailor stopping at different ports and, and telling the history of what had happened, you know, uh, uh, newspapers being intercepted by Spanish colonial officials who were trying to suppress that history and memory but it couldn't be suppressed. And I, I think a really important fact is that, you know, the, the, the new Black Republic of Haiti gave support, military support, uh, you know, strategic support to people that were struggling for independence in the Americas against colonialism. But they did it on the condition that, uh, a, a, for example, a newly independent uh, Mexico or Venezuela could not in those countries, uh, they could not have slavery. So, you know, there's a way in which the abolitionist project has itself an internationalism that I think when we, when, when we root our history of internationalism there, an entirely different uh, you know, new picture of what we mean by internationalism comes to view. It's also interesting, what you, and what you touched on here that you really delve into in the book is how and we'll focus on Mexico, but both Haiti and Mexico, but focusing again on Mexico, became real centers of revolutionary thought, real centers of people coming in who who wanted to take on the oppressor and learned. I mean, I, I don't think most people realize the numbers of people from Latin America that you write about that ended up in Haiti learning about revolution and taking that back home that these connections were never given us before, you know? I mean, all we see about is Haiti is a revolution that you, you may know the United States didn't recognize it and despised it, this black republic, but we never knew, for at least I never knew, the, the extent to which um, Haiti affected movements across Latin America that then began to affect the entire world. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think the book is really trying to intervene in some of the... Um, we might call them the kind of heuristics of history or the, you know, the organization of how we're often taught history, right? There's labor history over here, uh, you know, that might primarily deal with industrial workers, industrial Western male workers, mostly their histories against colonialism, which kind of gets slotted somewhere else. And there's histories against slavery. And we're often taught to think about them separately. But when you go into the archive, that's not what happened. So, you know, uh, I, I, a real fruitful document for me was a speech that Frederick Douglass gives in 1848 called The Revolutions of 1848. And he's doing this on uh, an Emancipation Day holiday. This is a big holiday for abolitionists. Um, and he's choosing to talk about the revolutions that are happening in Europe at that time. But in this speech and in so many other of his writings at that time, he is consciously making these connections, you know, thinking about how worker struggles in Western Europe are tied to struggles, uh, you know, for example, of Irish people fighting against British colonialism or Mexican people that are fighting against military aggression or struggles of indigenous people. And, you know, so it's not as if I'm inventing a kind of 21st century lens to look back <laughs> on the 19th century. Right. I'm saying, you know, we, we have to be able to disrupt you know, a little bit, these kind of hardened categories that sometimes prevent us from understanding history as it unfolded and solidarity as it developed. And I, when you mentioned Frederick Douglass, um, just jumping ahead a little here, but when you mentioned Frederick Douglass, you, 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 you talk a lot about in the book, both W.E.B. Du Bois and Frederick Douglass and how their internationalism, how their understanding of the oppression that they came out of is connected to the oppression across the globe and how that was directly connected to Mexico for both of them, but especially Frederick Douglass and how the, and, 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 and how those, those struggles were not separate and we're not seen as separate that we've, we've mm -hmm. lost that in many ways. Absolutely. Well, I, you know, 
the book really leans on Douglas and Du Bois and uh, Flores Magon's um, uh, analysis of the global capitalist system. And I think the argument that they don't get credited for making enough is, you know, how profound, particularly for Douglas, to be able to narrate the expansion of the global capitalist system as it was unfolding. So, you know, in one of his most famous speeches, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, that, you know, as, as we as I think we tend to call it, he he has these dramatic insights about a whole new world coming into being in the mid-19th century, right? There is a vast expansion of 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 the capitalist world. You know, he, he talks, there are 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 you know, quotes that we sometimes give to 20th century, late 20th century scholars about the, you know, uh, Marxist scholars to think about the annihilation of space by time. But Douglas is there. He's living it. He's observing it. He's He talks about how, uh, you know, uh, space is comparatively annihilated, he says. You know, uh, he describes, he says, the world has become a whispering gallery. You know, thoughts yes. that are whispered in one part of the planet are distinctly heard on the other side. And so, you know, I there, this is really critical to the argument, the way the global capitalist system is shifting uh, at that time. And not only is it, you know, allowing for the transportation of new goods and services and labor and people, but in that metaphor that Douglas is giving it, the world has become a whispering gallery. You know, it's precisely this, that thoughts that are whispered in one part of the world are distinctly heard in another and, you know, there's there's a form of internationalism that develops alongside the particular internationalization of capital that Douglas is describing. Yeah, and I think that the, the, those connections are really also not really kind of understood by many. And I think that that's part, that to me, that's one of the powers of, 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 of your book is that it brings those things. It brings all that together. And, you you know, I want to I want to kind of there's so many characters in this book. I mean, it. You could see how this book could be unwieldy, but it's not, because somehow you manage to bring all these characters from different parts of the globe together to, to, to kind of in a concise story um, about about the revolutionary movement from 1848 on, and to this and to this day. I mean, how they affected this day. Um, I, I want to kind of talk about this a bit in terms of some of the people you talk about and how they really define so much for us and we don't even think about them. I mean, how many people think of, of Ricardo Flores Magnon? Uh, people don't, I mean, some people may know the name and I know the name, um, but people like that are not kind of in the history books as someone who really affected change, that were, that pushed, that, 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 that built movements. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so talk a bit about him. Talk a bit about him and, and how he, and what, that brought to the struggle? Sure. Well, um, maybe the most important thing to note is, well, it's just become 2023, but we just came out of the year 2022. And in Mexico, that was actually the year of Ricardo Flores Magón. The whole year was you know, dedicated to him by the Mexican government. 2022 was? 2022. Huh. It was the centenary of his death. He died 100 years before in, as you said, Leavenworth, uh, federal penitentiary uh, in Kansas, which is something I was really interested in. Um, so, you know, and I, I think it's important to say that there, you know, he's got a contested legacy. Ricardo Flores Magón was arguably one of this hemisphere's most fiery and spirited class war anarchists. He was a major agitator, uh, journalist, uh, you know, organizer uh, in the lead up and in the beginning of the Mexican Revolution, and did quite a lot of his organizing here in the United States while he was in exile. And there's a, you know, I think a very interesting story about how this man who so wanted to overthrow the Mexican government, who so, you know, at his heart was a, a, a total anarchist, um, had his uh, body removed and reburied into the rotunda of illustrious men in Mexico. So, you know, as I say in the book, there's this uh, fiery anarchist who's consecrated in the heart of the state, contradictorily. <laughs> um, and I, I think it's also just worth mentioning that the uh, families and fellow students of the um, missing Ayo 43 students from Ayotzinapa have, uh, you know, students who it, it's now revealed were disappeared by state actors in Mexico, have organized against the government in a committee called the Ricardo Flores Magón Committee. Mm. So even though there's this, you know, attempt to consecrate uh, and, and capture the memory of Ricardo Flores Magón, there is a living memory of him 
as a radical in Mexico. So part of what my uh, my book does is also to highlight how he had a huge impact on radicals in the United States and you know around the world. He continually was making these appeals saying, uh, you know, Mexican workers, the eyes of the entire world are upon you. You know, if you're able to break the chains of the world's money lords, like you will oxygenate the freedom of, of struggles around the world. Uh, and, um, you know, he's also commanding other radicals. Like if you care about capitalism, if you care about racism, if you care about imperialism, you will see your struggle in the Mexican revolution. So, you know, I, I, there's not a lot of analysis that needs to assist Magon, you know, a lot of it is just highlighting things that he said. In the book, I highlight, uh, you know, his final years, which were in Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary. So, uh, you know, this was kind of an accidental find. But in the process of, of going through a lot of his papers and the papers of his comrades, I found this very interesting episode where not only was Flores Magon in this prison, along with other Mexican revolutionaries, but in this period, he was joined by radicals of every stripe, communists, socialists, pacifists, you know, organizers who were key to struggles against Jim Crow racism, uh, you know, who were all thinking and uh, reading and learning and organizing together in what the federal government called a university of radicalism. So I call this chapter how to make a university because I'm really interested, <laughs> you know, in how these radicals were communicating together and, and what sort of conversations they were having. So... <clears throat> I'm going, to, I'm going to come back to the, how Leavenworth became this university and and the men that were in prison there in that period and how about that period also defined where we are today, I think, in, in America um, with the surveillance of the state that we don't realize that connection, which so we'll come to that. But I, I really want to give people a sense and flavor of what you reveal in this book and in your studies about how and why Mexico is central to all of this. Why it's that, it, in, that, that we don't think about this at all in terms of both it's, it's kind of Mexico's path towards revolution and change, how it redefined the struggle, how it happened at the same time as the Russian Revolution, but in a very different way, and, and, and how it inspired so many. We don't, we, it, it, it's something that we don't really... That, that most people don't have in their in their consciousness, you know. We all know about the Bolsheviks and overthrowing the Russian government, the Tsar, but not Mexico. How Mexico was like the linchpin to so much, and that really is part. I think at the heart of the thesis is your book. Sure. Well, you know, maybe I can talk a little bit about how I I came to the work uh, yeah. because I, you know, it's an unexpected story and it was an unexpected, uh, you know, route to to find it. Um, a lot of uh, my family um, come from Okinawa, uh, and they, like a lot of people at the time, came through Mexico into the United States. Uh, and I um, was interviewing some of them about the Japanese American internment, and one of them told me this incredible story. He said his father had, um, you know, a lot of my family was in the Imperial Valley, which is on the U.S. Mexico border, uh, and. Uh, you know, um, one relative's, uh, my, my great uncle, he was a labor organizer there. He was a, a farm worker. He was a labor organizer. He could speak English, Spanish, Japanese, as well as Okinawan mm. dialect. So he was a very well-placed organizer. So people don't know that in the early rounds of the internment, the FBI did these massive raids, uh, particularly targeting organizers. And my great uncle was one of the people who was arrested in one of these raids. And what year are we talking this, about? This is 43, okay. 1943. Mm -hmm. So my uh, uncle said, you know, his, 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 they came for his dad. Uh, his, his dad saw these federal agents coming to the door. You know, he didn't know what was going on. But what my uncle said is since he had been down in Mexico fighting with Pancho Villa and them, he knew how to take care of business. So if he was going down, <laughs> he was going to take these federal agents down with him. <laughs> and so I had to, I had to, you know, hit pause on the tape recorder and say, what, what did you say? Uh, and so, um, you know, uh, I, I was really motivated to just think about this question, right? Because it just rearranged so much of what I thought about World War II, about Japanese American radicalism, about my own family's history. And, you know, I really had to ask this question, why would people from Okinawa, like if, if this was true, 
why would they find affinity with Mexican peasants who are fighting in their own revolution enough that they would, you know, like uh, fight, find alliances and apparently leave and come back to Mexico? So I was able to find um, a story of somebody who was close to my family. His name was Paul Kochi, who wrote a memoir uh, called Ima no Iowa, an immigrant sorrowful tale, uh, where he talks about being in revolutionary Mexico and finding internationalism. Um, and so, uh, I, you know, I can read a, a, a part of this if you like. Oh, that oh, would be like. great. No, that's, that's a good part of the book, too. Please, well, The whole book is good. That's a good piece to read, folks. Go ahead. <laughs> Sure. So, you know, I tell a little bit about um, his, his, you know, the, the guy gets incarcerated. The guy, uh, you know, is is hidden by different indigenous families. He's smuggled by French traders. And at every episode, he's talking about how he discovers internationalism. So I come out of the story oh, this way. I say, Paul Kochi's story demonstrates how the uprooted, dispossessed, and despised of the world came to know each other in shadows. In the tangled spaces of expulsion, extraction, transportation, debt, exploitation, and destruction, the garroting circuits of modern capital, whether crammed in tight ship quarters, knocking together over the rails, sweating and swaying in the relentless tempo of industrial agriculture, inhaling the dark air of mine shafts, hearing each other breathing, coughing, fighting, singing, snoring, and sighing through thin walls, or corralled like livestock in jails and prisons. The contradictions of modern capital were shared in its intimate spaces. Within such sites, people discovered that the circuits of revolution, like the countervailing circuits of capital, were realizable in motion, often through unplanned assemblages. Roaring at their backs were the revolutionary currents of the 19th uh, century, currents that howled from the metropolitan hearts of empire and wailed across the peripheries of the global world system. Standing before them in the middle of its own revolution was Mexico. From the vantage point of these struggles, the new century did not simply portend the inevitability of urban revolts and insurgencies at the point of production, but an epic of peasant wars, rural uprisings, anti-colonial movements, and of course, the Mexican Revolution. Mexico is both a real country and an imagined space of revolution would become a crucible of internationalism for the world's rebels like Paul Kochi. Hmm. And folks, if, as you're listening and watching this, this is one of the reasons you need to read the book besides the history in it, how it's written. There's, it's poetry with substance. <laughs> That's how I thought of it. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> it, really, it really is. I mean, it's so, yeah, the, one of the things that that made me think about was throughout the book, there's this kind of cross-fertilization across racial and ethnic lines that has taken place in Mexico, in California, across it all. And how racism is so deep that even in the left in the 20th century and late part of the 19th century, they didn't, people did not want to recognize um, the meetings you talk about that took place after the Russian Revolution, how people did not want to recognize the centrality of race and racism to all of this. Um, in the, be, targeted at, at, at black folks, at African Americans, Mexicans, Okinawans, whoever it was, the great other for the Europeans. And how that really kind of upended the revolutions in many ways, you know, and and you try to get to the heart of that and how these roots speak to that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, you know, I think one really fascinating story that's illustrative of this point is the story of M. N. Roy. Oh yeah, I was. About, I'm so, glad you raised that. That's good. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh yes. So, you know, I mean, he's another figure that I think doesn't you know, maybe normally come to mind when we're thinking about early 20th century revolutions or Mexico. Uh, Roy was um, a, a diehard uh, militant against British colonialism in India. Uh, and I tell the story about how he, you know, in the course of trying to find arms and supports for, a, a you know, an armed struggle against British colonialism ends up in Mexico in 1917. And as he writes in his memoir, Mexico became the land of his rebirth. And he describes that it was in Mexico, he becomes an internationalist. And, you know, part of the way he narrates it is some uh, journalists asked him to talk about the struggle, uh, the Indian anti-colonial struggle to, to Mexican people. And he says, in the course of writing this article, he realizes that uh, explaining this struggle was like carrying coal to Newcastle. You know, he didn't have <laughs> to introduce these dynamics to people in Mexico. But, you know, 
underscore what already resonated in the struggle that was underway. So he says that it was in Mexico he became an internationalist. What makes Roy such an interesting figure is that he ended up co-founding the Mexican Communist Party, you know, which, I mean, in the history of the founding of the Communist Party, you know, in the early 20th century, this is actually kind of normal that there are people from other places and other struggles who come to find themselves in the mix and, uh, you know, are really pivotal to the founding of these different parties. So Roy, um, Roy co-founds the Mexican Communist Party. And what's really interesting is he goes as a delegate to the Comintern. And uh, for some people on the left, his name uh, is centrally known or centrally attached to these debates on the national and colonial question, right? He had a famous debate with Lenin about what the role of colonized people was going to be right. in a global revolutionary <laughs> struggle. Uh, you know, and Roy's point was simply that, you know, it's it's somewhat odd that around, you know, that the 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 propulsion of revolutionary struggle in the Western world is the working class. But in the colonies, there's this assumption that the workers are of too backward of a, a nature and need, you know, and so the revolutionary thrust is going to come from the petty bourgeoisie. And, and Roy's like, what's the, what's the difference? You know, like, why, <laughs> why, you know, like we're workers too. And why this condescension? What's really interesting is a lot of the arguments that he makes there are prefigured in the writings he does in Mexico, trying to triangulate these experiences. So this is just one instance of how radicals in this period are trying to think, you know, both about struggles against racism and colonialism in very specific and localized contexts, but trying to think with revolutionaries around the world about what this means for a global class struggle. And also kind of what the way you put this in the book for all these people we're going to get into in just a moment, um, like a, a um, the 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 some the, you, you, when we talk about the women in in the book um, Elizabeth Catlett and others that that you really kind of hit a nerve about the paternalistic nature of the European based left, not acknowledging that the 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 complexity of race and racism, not and saying oh you, well you have to go through these stages of capitalism first before you can come and and have a revolution. You're not ready yet. We are, but you're not, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, and as I as I was reading that, I made me think about that was has been part of the destruction of the left, of how it lost, how it loses after it wins, by not understanding that critical factor of our existence. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, I think we could spend a whole another hour just trying to think <laughs> about problems with the left. Uh, and, and some of these kind of majoritarian strategies that say, you know, uh, kind of obscenely that the working class is X. And so then considerations about gender and sexuality and racism and disability are somehow like distractions. And we need to move, you know, this imagined center first before we can address these other issues instead of dealing with the fact that the working class in this country and around the world, you know, are people of color, are queer people, are people who are disabled. So, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I completely agree with you that this is an issue that the left continues to grapple with. And part of, you know, the reason I highlight the figures that I highlight in the book and, you know, half the book is about feminists. Half the book right. is about how different feminist organizers have approached these questions was a way of saying we don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, <laughs> it's it's not as if this is the first time we've had these considerations. It's not as if this is the first time we've thought about how a class struggle has to for, you know, put at the forefront sex workers renters, people that are struggling over social reproduction, people who are struggling over access to relief, you know, that these have been constitutive parts of how we understand revolutionary struggle. And so it's not so much trying to tinker with, you know, uh, theory in, in, in the present to perfect it, but it means grappling with these past debates and these past, uh, you know, central figures who have made these arguments and organized at, at, at huge scales in the past. And I think that the stories you have here, um, talking about the women, which are again are are, are are central to the book. They're probably the most important characters in the book in many ways. Um, whether we're talking about Alexandra Kolontai, who was the amb Russian ambassador, we can talk about her to to Mexico. Dorothy Healy. I never think of Dorothy Healy in this in this way. I mean, having read her stuff when I was younger, but I never thought about Dorothy Healy in terms of Mexico or and 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 Elizabeth Catlett, the great artist, um, that you also don't think about in this way. 
So I, I want to kind of approach this in two ways. A, I, want, I want to make sure we get these stories out on the table, who these women were, why they were so central to it all. But B, and B, not but, and B, it also talks to the centrality of your theme, which is how important the Mexican Revolution was and is to the planet and to change and to other movements around the globe. And these women are the, and these women in many ways are that connective tissue. Absolutely. Well, I would say that the, you know, the, the, the big uh, organizing theme of the book is a concept uh, I have called convergence spaces. So these are sites where different radical traditions are compressed together in struggle, uh, you know, that usually produce new articulations of struggle. And I think, you know, my motivation with that is to show that the kind of theory, the way that people make sense of the world that they're in and produce radical theory is something that happens all the time. It's something that we don't always give people credit for. And I think that that's really dangerous. If we think about theory only being done, you know, by elites that are removed from struggle, you know, as if people are not capable of doing it, I, you know, I think we develop a totally different theory of radical change. So, you know, as an example, I, I, I think about Dorothy Healy, who was, you know, before she became the Dorothy Healy that I think a, a lot of people in this country know, you know, someone who was a mentor to people like Mike Davis. Uh, she was a young, uh, a, a very young communist militant. She was somebody who, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the book, I talk about how she was at the forefront of a shared struggle in Southern California. She was a key organizer of the Unemployed Council in the depression. Uh, so these were uh, organizations of unemployed people before there was any, you know, federal aid from the new deal. Um, but she also went to places like the Imperial Valley and organized with farm workers. And so as an example of what I'm talking about by convergence spaces, I tell a story about what it meant when she met up with all these different striking lettuce workers, you know, in the Imperial Valley you know, as I said, where my family was from. Um, and she, you know, she reflects in this oral history with Maurice Isherman that she's like, you know, I, she's feeling her oats. She's talking to all these workers about a radical struggle and what it means, you know, what capitalist exploitation means. And she says, you know, there's a lot of Mexican workers. Uh, there's a lot of Filipino and black and poor white workers, but a lot of the Mexican workers, they kind of fold their arms. And she says they she realizes they're nodding their head with a kind of patient indulgence. And then they're like, right, right. So we just went through a revolution. <laughs> so, you know, how about you tell us when you need us to be on the barricades and we'll be there, but don't start lecturing us about what it means to have a radical struggle against, you know, like capitalist U.S. bosses. We've been fighting this for a really long time. So, you know, I mean, it, 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 that's one example of many of how we can think about struggles that we might code in a different way, you know, these uh, dramatic struggles by farm workers in the 1930s, that could just be slotted under industrial history. But when we think about all the different radical traditions that were compressed together, you know, in struggle, I think we have a totally different sense of that radical history and also of how the Mexican Revolution and its legacies was woven through. And, you know, I think the, 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 uh, the Elizabeth Catlett story about how, again, people know her as one of the great artists that the United States ever produced. Um, and this light coming out of the African-American world, an incredible work, but not about her connection to Mexico and how Mexico, again, influenced her so deeply the, and, the, and, and the artistic world of Mexico and the revolution in Mexico just affected her work and her life and how that also translates into the bridge that creates this kind of unity we don't even think about. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think it's a surprise to a lot of people because Elizabeth Catlett's art is, is omnipresent. It's everywhere. It's the cover of a lot of books and posters and magazines, you know, particularly ones that either, you know, think really deeply about the history of black power, you know, prominently from the 60s on, but also these beautiful prints she did, particularly of black working class women that, you know, she was doing, uh, you know, from the 1930s on. So I think it would really surprise people to learn that she did most of that work in Mexico where she spent the majority of her life. Uh, you know, and the the way I came to her story, I wasn't intending to write about her. Um, I'm so glad I stumbled upon her. Mm. I, I was in the archives looking uh, through the collection of the Taller de Grafica Popular, which was an internationalist art collective based in Mexico City. 
it had this really interesting relationship to the, you know, great long traditions of uh, print culture in Mexico. Um, and they had assembled this whole series about the history of the Mexican Revolution. They did, you know, like a uh, just a number of prints narrating each episode. And I, I just was curious, you know, how were people in the 1940s thinking back about the history of the Mexican Revolution? So I'm looking through all these pictures and then at the bottom in the same box was a series called The Black Woman, and it was by Elizabeth Catlett. And in that series, she has figures like Phyllis Wheatley and Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman. She has black women that are at the forefront of unemployed council, uh, you know, organizing, uh, women who are organizing against segregation on buses. And, you know, I, I thought, I was like, are these is this mislabeled? <laughs> Should I tell the archivist? Uh, and then I started to realize, no, they're in the same box. They were created at the same time. And I started putting some of the prints out and I realized not only were they made at the same time, but they were very consciously produced alongside each other. So there are ways in which in the Tayers uh, uh, images, there's a picture of say Pancho Villa uh, or Emiliano Zapata. And the, you know, in Catlett's uh, black woman series, there's similar pictures of Phyllis Wheatley, you know, that, that they're stylistically, they were clearly done, you know, with a consciousness of each other, which I thought was really fascinating. But then moving through and seeing that their pictures of, for example, the intense, uh, violent exploitation of indigenous people was rendered in a very similar way to the way that Catlett talked about lynching in the U.S., mm. And so, you know, so this opened up a whole different question for me about not only what were these artists doing with each other, but how did they understand the resonance between this history? And what did it mean that they were doing this in the 1940s, you know, which is, I think, uh, precedes the period when a lot of us would imagine this kind of internationalist consciousness would have been existent. And I think that's really, to me, I mean, I, I, I do encourage people to read this book. I just think it's, I mean, uh, m many academic scholars don't know how to write, so we like to read them. <laughs> you, I mean, but in this book, as I said to you, I think earlier before we started, was there? There's, it's like this. There's, there's, you write poetically with substance, and I think that it engages you to come in to want to read this book even more. Um, and I, I think that what to me the most important part of this is for this book for me was opening up a door to understanding the importance of Mexican history and society and struggles in Mexico and how they inspired the entire planet and how they deeply interact with this world, um, with this world in the United States. And, and, you know, whether it is just kind of think about this, whether it is, you know, I think when you write this line, the, the end of your, near the end of your book, I, I, you know, might, mind if I read it? I'm just going to just read Please. this. I just love this piece. Um, um, you write, it's not by moral outrage that alone that people have lent their lives to the struggle for better worlds. Neither is it by the purity of instruction from theory. There is certainly no royal road, and the only one made by walking. Many have walked, many have been forced to move, many have found roads while walking with others. This book has attempted to map some of the movement in the hope of making the future roads possible. Here it goes. History is not a guide, but a map drawn in the star, stars of past lights. Out of the prison of the present is a recognition. We've been warned by others, by other fires that we have not built. What warmth and light shall we leave behind? So I, I wanted to read that just because to me, the heart of your book is talking about this history we don't understand about how Mexico inspired revolutions and revolutionaries and people across the globe that we don't give credit to, and especially now with the tensions around the border of the United States, to understand where all this came from and how we better understand this if we want to be able to define our own future. I, uh, you know, I think we'd all feel a lot stronger if we abandoned the kind of missionary approach to radicalism <laughs> that we thought we had, you know, right, the, right. The, the, the one true church and we were proselytizing to other people. I mean, there's a kind of a crime that happens in the writing of mainstream history that I think gets repeated in how we 
think and organizing, think and organize. And that's this idea that people's histories and consciousness begins as soon as they come into this country, right? When I think something really opens up when we do, you know, what, uh, I mean, we have an incredible tradition of historians and thinkers in this country who say, there are worlds, there are revolutionary struggles that people come from, you know, something as simple as a wage dispute in a restaurant by restaurant workers, you know, or a, uh, you know, a strike or a farm worker strike, as I talk about, these are deeply imbued with the different experiences that people bring to them that we don't always have a language to understand. I think anybody who's been a part of struggles, whether they're unionization efforts at logistics centers or Starbucks or, you know, any of these incredible strikes that are happening across campuses, you know, people realize that, you know, people come to struggle with a number of different experiences that have to be, you know, valued and uh, like learn from. And so I think if the book does anything, it's just an invitation to give us some language for how that's already been done. Because I don't think we have to, you know, as I said before, reinvent the wheel, you know, or create completely new answers. But I think there's a gentler method that we can open up and understand the worlds of radicalism that, you know, the ex- extraordinary worlds that we have to draw from. And given sometimes the where the left can go, you really wrote a book. How about this? You wrote a really beautiful non-sectarian book. <laughs> Appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> that understands the, the roles that all these different groups played. And I and I want people to really understand why they should read this book, to really understand um, the power of Mexico and what Mexico gave the world and what it continues to give the world and it, and, and how everything, we, and, and how this internationalism was rooted there. And I and I just said, it's, it's, it's a marvelous piece of work. It must've taken you a Thank decade you. to write. <laughs> How about it took me a, it took me most of that time to write and then a, a little bit more time to edit down to what the press wanted me to do. I mean, can you imagine? It's like you said, the book starts in 1840 and ends in 1940. I was supposed to write like 85,000 words. My publisher was like, you got to be kidding. So I'm glad it's done. I'm, I'm happy it's in the world. And I, I really appreciate this opportunity to talk with you about it. Arise, Global Radicalism and the Era of the Mexican Revolution by Dr. Christina Heatherton. It's really well written. Um, you can't stop reading once you start. As I said to my friend in an email to Marcus Redeker, I said, this is, this is one of those books. And uh, I want to thank you so much. This is a fantastic work. And I look forward to many more conversations. And just uh, maybe as we explore the world here at The Real News and on The Mark Steiner Show, uh, just having you on to talk about taking your viewpoint coming out of all of this about what we face and where we have to go. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And once again, thank you to Dr. Christina Hertherton for this book and this conversation. And once again, thank you to all of you for joining us today. Please let me know what you thought about what you heard and what you'd like us to cover. Just write to me at mss at therealnews.com, and I promise I'll write you right back. And if you have an extra minute, stay there. Go to www.therealnews.com, become a monthly donor, become part of the future with us. So for Cameron Grandino and Kayla Rivera, And the crew here at The Real News, I'm Mark Steiner. Stay involved, keep listening, and take care. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.